Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started in just one minute. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to PHS Live. My name is Natalie Shulstead, and I am the Director of Programs and Services at the Presbyterian Historical Society. And we are so thrilled to host this conversation about the Community School of Tehran. And we're so happy you could join us today. So before we begin, just a reminder that we are recording the session and streaming live on Facebook. We would also like to welcome audience participation. So please enter any questions you have during the session in the Q&A by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we should have some time later in the session for audience questions. Our roundtable discussion will be led by Matthew Shannon, who is Associate Professor of History at Emory and Henry College and also a research fellow at the Baskerville Institute, where he is the principal investigator on the Community School Oral History Project. Matthew has also been a longtime researcher at PHS and has relied on our collections to study mission work in Iran. So before I turn it over to him, I'd like to share a little bit about the PHS collections and our role in Matthew's oral history project. So for those of you who are new to PHS, we are the National Archives of the Presbyterian Church USA and its predecessor denominations. So we hold records of congregations, mid-councils, and agencies of the church. We also serve as the archives for several ecumenical organizations, including the Federal and National Council of Churches, the Church World Service, the American Sunday School Union, and the Religious News Service, among others. We also actively collect the records of several Presbyterian affiliated schools and organizations, as well as personal papers of individuals and families who provided a unique service to the church, including in the mission field. Our holdings include both administrative records and personal papers that cover the church's work in Iran, in particular, the work of the Commission on Ecumenical Mission and Relations, whose records broadly cover the church's evangelical, medical, and educational work in Iran, including the establishment of churches, hospitals, and schools, including community school. Because these collections focus on the administration of community school, the student and faculty perspective is not well covered in our collection. So for that reason, we are so excited to partner with Matthew on the community school oral history project in order to better fill in these gaps to tell a more complete story of community school. So the oral histories created through this project will be published and made freely available online in our digital archives, where we have already started a collection focusing on community school. And we will share a link to that in the chat. So you can take a look at that at your convenience. That collection currently includes oral histories conducted by Julian Cole Phillips with former community school teachers and students in 2015. So Matthew's work has not yet been added there, but it will be available at that link later on. And with that, I will turn it over to Matthew to tell us a bit more about the oral history project and introduce our panelists. So. Well, thank you so much. Um... Uh, to everyone for being here and spending your afternoon or evening or whatever it is in your time zone uh, talking and thinking about community school. Um, a special thanks to Natalie and, and Kristen um, for, you know, kind of supporting this project and helping organize this event and helping digitize documents and just uh, to all of the staff and archivists at the Presbyterian Historical Society. I mean, a lot of our research relies you know, so heavily on them. And uh, we really are in a lot of debt to, to them and all the archivists who support our work. 
um, thanks to the Baskerville Institute. If it wasn't for um, the year of, you know, kind of um, this year, this past academic year with the research fellowship through them, I wouldn't have had the time um, in my course load or, you know, just the energy to kind of think about a new uh, project like this. So it was really, you know, kind of their kind of support that, you know, kind of uh, sparked this project and, and help kind of create space so it could come together. Um, so why am I um, interested in this um, project in the community school oral history project? Um, well, I recently finished a book manuscript on the Presbyterian mission and the broader American mission in Iran in the mid 20th century. Um, and as Natalie suggested, the voices of community school students are not you know, represented in the archives. There's of course voluminous holdings at PHS, but you know, students um, are, you know, kind of more or less a, a statistic in annual reports. Um, and if it weren't for uh, yearbooks and, and other, you know, kind of pieces of material out there, it would be difficult to um, recover kind of from textual sources, the voices of students. Um, so as I, you know, finished that book and it's, it's submitted now, I was thinking about kind of how to, you know, add a layer of depth to this uh, history. And uh, beyond that, I would just say there was a general interest, not just in the history of U.S.-Iran relations, but especially in the history of international education. So when I was submitting that manuscript, it's, you know, I'm trying to think of ways not to kind of leave the subject and, and put it down, uh, just on a, on a personal note. Um, uh, I will share very quickly a screen uh, with you all. Hopefully you can see it okay. And... Um, it didn't disrupt the view too much. Um, I conducted the first interview of, you know, the oral history project um, with Christine Westberg, who's here with us today, but um, there are many more interviews to come and none of the interviews thus far have been posted on uh, the PHS Pearl Digital Archive. Um, so I just want to emphasize in my few minutes here that this project is building, you know, on the work of so many others um, whether they're, you know, kind of published books uh, that you can buy online or archival holdings at PHS or um, whatever it may be. Um, more broadly, of course, there are, you know, oral histories of U.S.-Iran relations that many of us benefit from in our research. Many of them are available online. Um, the Association for Diplomatic Studies and Training has its Iran reader with you know, many, many pages of interviews with uh, diplomats who served in Iran prior to 1979. There's the Foundation for Iranian Studies Oral History Program, which includes interviews with folks actually who were involved with community school, uh, in addition to many other individuals. Harvard's Iranian Oral History Project, um, very valuable over the years. Uh, and more recently, I've been learning from colleagues, um, such as uh, Cameron Amin's work on the Iranian diaspora uh, in the Iranian American community in Southeast Michigan and uh, working out of UM Dearborn and Yasmin Rostam Kolai's work on the Peace Corps Iran Association. So um, there's a lot out there. With regard to PHS, um, you saw on the first screen the cover page of the Elder Family Oral History Growing Up in Iran, which was uh, done a little over a decade ago. It's available at PHS. Uh, the Julian Cole Phillips interviews, especially important from his 2015 NYU thesis, at least eight interviews conducted with students and faculty, including Harry Shamoon, who's here with us today. Um, and at PHS, there are many other interviews and unpublished memoirs that, you know, have yet to kind of you know, uh, see the light of day. In the lower left-hand screen, you see books that are available that deal in various uh, ways with community school, including one by Tara Barampur. Um, and in the lower right-hand, at least it's, that's what it looks like to me, uh, you can see that faculty and alumni have been providing us with information to draw on so that we can do a historically informed critical and contextual oral history project at this moment in time. Uh, people like Sarah McDowell and Commodore Fisher who were involved with the school in its early days uh, the community school reunion page and its library, uh, various pieces that have been published in newspapers, online, uh, and in print, and you know reunion lectures and essays that have been prepared uh, over the years. So I see the community school oral history project that I'm working on just as kind of one piece 
in this broader kind of effort to bring this uh, history to light. And it provides an opportunity through the Pearl Digital Archive to bring together a lot of existing material in one place so that students and, and researchers and just the general public can uh, access the information uh, more easily and, and learn about the interesting history of, of, of community school. So with that, um, I will turn it over to our uh, first roundtable discussant, who is Michael Zarinsky, Community School Class of 1960. Thank you, Matt. I hope I hope you hear me well. Uh, I didn't know I was going to go first, and I'm, as usual, suffering uh, opening day jitters. And so I wrote up something which I hope is not going to take too long, and I hope it's not going to be too boring. First of all, I want to thank you and Kristen and Natalie for arranging this. I think the project is enormously important, and I'm looking forward to the product of it. I was a student in community school in grades 9 through 12, graduating in 1960, along with 38 others. It was a small class, and consequently, I got to know some of my classmates quite well. My community experience, immensely different from the suburban Long Island, New York elementary schooling that I had had previously, has deeply shaped my life, personally and professionally. I forged lifelong friendships with schoolmates now scattered around the world, and many of them I am in regular contact with, some on an almost daily basis. We were of many nationalities expatriates like myself, Iranians who began their education abroad, and most strikingly to me, refugees from the horrors of the early 20th century, children without countries or passports who were given asylum by Iran and welcomed into an international community by our school. As I wrote in my reunion essay on community school and 20th century history, uh, which I first produced for the 1995 reunion in Toronto. It was not until I connected with alumni who I did not know that I realized I was part of a unique shared experience which shaped us all deeply and which was almost impossible to explain to anyone who had not been there. Community school transformed me from a suburban American kid into something quite different, and I hope much more complex. It helped determine where I would go for higher education, among other things, making it possible for me to meet and marry another third culture soul, a Presbyterian minister's daughter, in fact, who likes to joke that her family moved a continent every generation. Eventually, I became a student and historian of 20th century Europe and of the West relations with the Middle East. I chose to do so because of my community school experience. In both teaching and writing, I am shaped by the vision of the modern European past presented in the 10th grade class taught by then principal J. Richard Irvine. Although Iranian history was not addressed in the curriculum that I experienced that community, nor indeed in my further education formally, my experience at community school shaped my understanding of Iran and its relations with the West. Consequently, my efforts to understand the origins of the revolution that broke out in 1978 and its anti-American rhetoric I sought out records of the Presbyterian mission and its relations with Iran and Iranians during the century before my birth. There I found traces of dozens of men and women, educators, medical missionaries, who made lifelong commitments to the people of Iran and doing their best along the way to render unto God what is God's while rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar's. This, of course, is a reference to a New Testament verse, which I first heard and read at community school in the required Bible class. Mr. Irvine, my great teacher in the 10th grade, 
died some days ago, the evening after the Good Friday celebration of his 99th birthday. It was already Easter in Jerusalem. He and his wife, Marianne, had served the mission from 1951, when he was appointed principal of the community school, until 1967. In my view, Irvine saw himself as an educator in the tradition of 19th century missionaries who established schools throughout northern Iran, especially of Samuel Jordan, who in the early 20th century transformed his boys' school in Tehran into Albor's College, which in fact, for a brief period, was an Iranian version of the American University of Beirut. Albor's, along with other foreign schools, was which enrolled, enrolled Iranian students, was nationalized by Reza Shah's government in 1940. Community alone among the Presbyterian schools survived because it was a school for English speaking children. As principal from 1951, Mr. Irvine sought to make it possible for its graduates to enter universities in countries other than the US, including those in Iran and Europe. His efforts were coordinated with those of other educators around the world who eventually created the International Baccalaureate Program, which now operates in more than 5,400 schools and in over 150 countries throughout the world. Not all of his colleagues agreed with his vision. And when the mission board in New York sought to ease tension in Tehran by transferring the Irvines to Egypt, they resigned from the mission and established Iran Zamin Tehran International School, one of the first nine schools in the world to offer the international baccalaureate. Ironically, in later years, community school itself followed a path much like that of Iran Zamin. Mr. Irvine remained in Iran until 1980, long after the revolution had begun, peacefully negotiating the transfer of Iran Zamin to the Iranian government during the American embassy hostage crisis. I remember vividly his, his talking to me about how weird it felt when he would climb up the stairs or ride the elevator to the appropriate room in the foreign ministry building in Tehran uh, to continue this negotiation, knowing that some of the hostages were being held in that building as he was meeting with very polite and um, helpful uh, Iranian diplomats. I hope that the, Ira the community school oral history project, and this is my last paragraph, will also include Iran Zamin. As I think of Irvine's long and productive life, motivated in part by the biblical injunction about Caesar and God, as well as by the verse which he had inscribed over the front door of the school, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. I do not think that in his own mind, he ever left missionary work. Like Martin Luther in 1517, in 1967, he faced a conflict between what his institutional hierarchy wanted him to do and doing what he thought was right to do. Frankly, I cannot separate Iran Zamin from his work at community school. In both schools, he took concrete steps toward achieving the wish of Tom Fisher, community's first principal. And I quote here from an address he gave at uh, a reunion uh, long ago, if only the whole world were a community school. Uh, this is a bit too academic. It doesn't talk to my intense involvement in the school, both when I was there and since then, but it's what I've got to say. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, we'll hear next from Anna Costell, class of 1966. Okay, well, thank you, Matthew and Natalie and Kristen for making this possible. Um, when I started Zooming with my class of 66 two years ago, I had no idea what that would lead us to, and here we are. So a little bit about me and my involvement in community school. My name was Anna Starek. I am now a Costo. Um, I'm ethnically Czechoslovakian. I have a brother, Peter Starek, who was a class of 1955 graduate. So 12 years older than I am. Uh, how I came to be in Iran 
and for the entire duration, for the long duration, I went to community school from kindergarten through 12th grade. My family was in Iran from 1937 to 1966. My father was a Czech engineer, architect and director of a Czech construction company named Lana. And he was sent to Iran um, to construct some major infrastructure projects as the Reza Shah at the time was aiming to modernize the country. These included the building of dams, roads, tunnels countrywide, as well as the Banke Mali in Tehran and the Mashhad Railroad Station. His company and another one named Škoda brought many Czech families to Tehran. Other Czechs were also brought to Iran to manage operations such as power plants, sugar factories, armory, shoe factory named Meli Shoe, which in Czechoslovakia was called Batya Shoes. And we were Czechs, we ran the two breweries in Tehran. <laughs> So these are just to name a few. As a child and a teenager, I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to who did what, just that I had many Czech friends and we had a large community. This resonates with me now as my own children and now grandchildren had or have no idea what their friends' parents do for a living. So initially the Czech community in the 30s um, in early 40s, went to a Czech embassy school that, however, was closed, as were other foreign schools. And Michael Zarinsky referred to this. Um, and so we ended up, or our families ended up, not having a Czech school to go to. The option was either community school or one of the French-speaking Catholic schools uh, Jean d'Arc for girls in Saint Louis for the boys, also in Italian Don Bosco High School for boys. About half chose to attend the community school. So I attended community school in the 50s and 60s. And I'm told that we had 27 nationalities represented. Part of the reason I think that there were so many was political upheaval worldwide. And the other part was the continued modernization of Iran. In my family's case, and the case of most of the other Czechs, was by then the communists had occupied Czechoslovakia and nationalized all private enterprises. My parents gave up their Czech citizenship and my father converted Lana Construction Company into an Iranian corporation. So we stayed on. There were many other displaced people, former citizens from Poland, Russia, Armenia, Iraq, among others. The other non-American international students were children of foreign embassy employees and many new foreign corporations. I believe that this was about around this time when English became the international language instead of French. So the result being that the international community, the embassy kids chose community school for their children's education. Dr. Irvine and his staff fostered this microcosm of global unity. One of the events that I remember vividly was United Nations Day. A huge globe was formed out of chicken wire, was hung in the middle of the basketball court and students from each and every class, K through 12, took turns filling in the spaces, the holes of the chicken wire with either blue or beige crumpled crepe paper, thus creating the entire world, all the continents and the oceans. And the ceremony of the day began with a procession posting of flags of all the represented countries followed by classes and groups singing international folk songs and dancing international folk dance, all dressed in their national costumes. Of course, the school pledge of allegiance to my country and to the United Nations was sung, I mean, was part of the ceremony. And the song, My Country Tis of Thee, acknowledging that we all have our own countries, not just the US, was sung by all 
still makes me emotional today every time I hear it. As a school run by missionaries, each day I believe, my memory fails me, maybe it was once a week, maybe it was every day, started with assembly and chapel. Just a half an hour in the auditorium of announcements, scripture reading and the singing of hymns. I still know all the hymns. And as a Catholic, I grumble weekly that we Catholics just don't know how to sing. I never heard of any resistance to this routine. I guess it was when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And community school was our Rome run by Presbyterian missionaries. The academics followed the American core curriculum, which prepared us for SATs, ACTs, admission to US colleges, universities, and other English language institutions of higher education. In addition, community school offered us an array of courses in foreign language, art, music, Bible study, journalism. I remember taking an elective talk by Dr. Irvine in Persian poetry of all things. There we read and translated Saadi's poetry from Persian to English. What school will offer classes like that? Music and theater were a big part of our education. Each year there were performances, plays, operettas, Christmas concert, to name a few. Some of the ones that our class participated in were HMS Pinafore, Noah's Flood by Benjamin Britten, and the annual Christmas Carol. Community school can be proud of the achievement of their students and graduates. In my own family, my brother Peter Starek went on to become a renowned thoracic surgeon at UNC Chapel Hill, North Carolina. He was also instrumental in patenting Medtronic's pacemaker. Sadly, he passed away several years ago, but you can learn about him by going to UNC Chapel Hill website. Our class members also boast many worldwide successful people. They include doctors, professors, CEOs of global corporations. Two stand out in my mind. One is a California congressman and the other is the chair of Globe Women Research and Education Institute. I didn't ask their permission to use their names so I can't name them here. I wish I had. In the past two years, our classes attempted to contact as many members of the class of 66 as possible. We have a group of 14 or so that try to Zoom every two to three months. Not everyone can attend each time, but we have reignited friendships. What is amazing is that this connection was spearheaded of all things by a student who was with us only one year, fifth grade. If that does not speak to this school's influence on its students, I don't know what that what does. In conclusion, in my situation, I greatly appreciate community school serving a displaced population, providing an opportunity for us to immigrate to the US, attend colleges, universities, and to become citizens of a country that it taught us to love. Yesterday, I took a look through the links provided by PHS at the community school floor plans. Among them, I found the architectural drawings and bid for the teacher's residence built in the early 60s. I saw my father's drawings, his handwriting, and the logo Lana on the paperwork. I knew he had built this school, but seeing the plans was highly emotional for me then as it is now, as he sadly died in Iran in 66, just before I graduated. I have an appreciation for community school fostering tolerance for race, color, creed, all under the guidance of the Judeo Christian values without, to my knowledge, anyone resisting that umbrella, but rather recognizing that those same values are reflected worldwide and in all creeds. That is my impression. You have made me go back and think and show my family 
how important this education was for me. So thank you. Thank you. That was a very moving talk. Um, <laughs> yeah, but, I moved myself. <laughs> thank you. We'll, we'll hear from um, someone from your uh, same class or era next, um, Harry Shamoon, class of 1966. Thank you, Matthew and, and others for inviting me to participate. Uh, it's really an honor. I'll try to respect my five minute limit. Um, while presenting uh, a very impressionistic and uh, personal perspective, which I don't claim to be the truth. Um, I'm Harry Shamoon, and I was a student at community school between 1954 and 1961, grades one through seven. Uh, my experiences at community school echo what I've heard over the years and what I hear now from many other graduates how it felt truly like a community where kids from multiple cultures, religions, and nationalities mingled freely. I was born in Baghdad, Iraq, and although the Jewish community there was one of the oldest and largest in the Middle East, my parents had to escape in 1948 owing to another uh, uh, anti-Jewish uh, rampage, this one known as the Farhud. We settled in Tehran where my father had had previous business connections and though we were technically stateless and waiting for a US immigration visa that he had applied for. Uh, incidentally, it took 13 years through the quota system for that um, visa to arrive. For my parents, it was in this context of both um, fear of persecution, religious persecution uh, in the Middle East and hoping that my younger brother and I would, sorry hoping that my brother and I would eventually uh, be educated in an English speaking country. And it was in this context that they wanted us to attend community school. However, we only spoke Arabic and Persian at home. And since community school was only open to students who spoke English, I was sent to a preschool run by Mrs. Arpenig around the corner from our home, as I recall. She apparently did a good enough job that I entered community school in first grade, equipped not only with spoken and some written English, but also math skills, which of course then withered uh, with disuse until years later when they were needed uh, according to the community school curriculum. A few thoughts uh, that I just wanna mention that come to mind, uh, certainly not in an exhaustive or uh, uh, perhaps uh, deep way, but the first question that I'm asked and I think about is, as a missionary run school with the majority of teachers being young American missionaries, was there an overt or implicit effort to proselytize a group of children, the vast majority of whom were from Muslim, Jewish, or other faiths? I certainly remember that we had morning assemblies. I think they were morning every day, Anna, uh, during which we, recited the Lord's Prayer, sang hymns such as Onward Christian Soldiers, um, and a portrait of Jesus uh, hung in every classroom. And as you heard from Michael, emblazoned over the front entrance of the main building was that phrase from John 8.32, which was actually in Farsi, uh, in a mosaic. Uh, but I never felt that I was being subjected to any religious uh, pressure by my teachers. What they embodied, however, was uh, clearly this humanitarian and inclusive ethos that was explicitly stated by our principal, Richard Irvine, and was, I think, noticeable even to us uh, grade schoolers. More pervasive in Iran at that time was the influence of the American culture in general, not only at our school, but in the social milieu of our expatriate Iraqi Jewish community. Uh, for example, the US Armed Forces radio station, which was actually the only form of entertainment for a long while, <laughs> played American pop music with uh, requests by my classmates, as I recall. Uh, I became a member of the Boy Scouts of America, Troop Number One, Tehran, Iran, uh, proudly rising to the rank of first class scout and patrol leader. We children couldn't get enough of the American dream, especially comic books, jeans, cowboy outfits, and marshmallows. 
Of course, in a sense, we were part of a privileged middle class that benefited from the US presence in Iran. And please remember though, that we were at that time still in the shadow of a recent world war that the US had helped win and were living at the height of the Cold War. But the America we imagined was indeed an exceptional country. But a decade later, after my family and I had em emigrated to the US, we baby boomers also became the vanguard of America's 60s generation. Now both US foreign policy around the globe, as well as the civil rights movement back at home, created profound discordance for me with my community school upbringing. How could I square the image of America as a shining beacon of freedom and democracy with the realities around me? I think that in the end, actually what helped me make some sense of all this was my time in community school. I believe that the generosity of spirit and respect for people of all stripes that our school and its teachers embodied and expressed in many ways, large and small, became the touchstones of my life and ultimately shaped my appreciation for all that America, <clears throat> excuse me, for all that America, even with its imperfections has given us. So once again, thank you community school and thank you all. Thank you so much, Harry. Um, we'll hear next from Christine Westberg, class of 1973. Well, first of all, <laughs> this has been extraordinary for me so far to see my uh, tiny little uh, presence in this extraordinary history, which is I'm learning so much about for this. And along with uh, thanking everyone involved in this project for the privilege of speaking, I also want to give a shout out to the Presbyterian mission and whoever oversees its real estate holdings, because my class of 73 has had wonderful reunions that are affordable to all of us. Thanks to the discount that the Presbyterian mission gave to us in renting fabulous venues, campsites and uh, conference centers in Maine and in um, Tahoe and upstate New York. And this is because the most important thing to me about community is the enduring serious friendships that I made and in my four years there. I entered community school at the age of 13 in 1968 to begin ninth grade high school. I had already lived in Tehran since 1965. And I now can say that one thing I'm most grateful for is the comprehensive nature of my education. It marked me as an educated person for the rest of my life. And I'm talking about pop quizzes on Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Our curriculum, the required course of study was Old Testament in 10th grade. No, Old Testament was ninth grade, New Testament was 10th grade. Then we had world religions and then we had ethics. Now, um, this is particularly important to me now as I struggle in a sort of crossfire in my culture between the liberal leftarians and the right wing Christians, because I have a confidence in <laughs> biblical knowledge, which has come into such uh, an important place in my uh, intellectual musings of the moment. And I do see now that 1968, I entered in the transition year from Irvine to Mr. Hill. 
And although I remember having come from quite a secular, I would say Christian humanist background, the turbans, the dark skins, the fact that the teachers were addressed as sir and ma'am, which was really weird to me. The um, most exotic thing actually was the weekly chapel. My year, I only remember it being weekly and it was a just a normal sort of assembly. And I don't recall praying. What I do recall is a prayer broadcast over the loudspeaker every morning where we had to stand still, you know, stop the soccer, stop the gossiping, stand still. And all I remember is the final words and the crown prince. Now, anybody out there who has the text to that prayer that was said in the 1970s every morning, please get in touch with me. I've been trying to find it for years. So there was a prayer every morning, but there definitely were not images of Jesus Christ uh, on the walls. But I will say that it's very important to me to realize that in our Old Testament and New Testament classes, the textbook was the Bible as history by a remarkable scholar, a German scholar, William Keller, survivor and resistance, resistor to the Nazis, and by no means an evangel evangelical take on the Bible. It, it completely connected the stories of the Bible and things that we could see with our own eyes, whether it was the ruins on all the field trips or the shepherds who were still tending their flocks on the borders of our city. And so I've been very curious about that, about how um, uh, comprehensive it seems to me the educational philosophy was and having had no sense, I mean, of, of coercive or doctrinal approach to uh, the Bible or to any kind of religion. Our teachers, who I only have now found out were indeed missionaries, were all guitar st strumming sort of folkies. And uh, I don't know though, how this is different for um, my non-Christian friends. We have discussed this, but I want to just say again, to reiterate, everything that has been said so far about that particular little piece of Tehran in the globe was an absolute haven. And I am going to repeat, if only the world <laughs> was a community school. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Um... We'll hear next from Shireen Day, class of 1978. Unmute. Hi, and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's in really interesting to hear what everyone else is saying because I only learned a couple of years ago during a community school reunion thing that the school actually was had a chapel and that had chapel services and such. I was there from April of 1972 through my 10th grade year in 1976. And by then there was only Mr. Hill's morning prayer, which Mr. Magana, who was the principal after him continued. And I do have a friend who knows that prayer word for word. So I'm sure I can, can get it for you, Natalie. Um, but school was very much an international collective community. And it was just an incredibly rich environment. and. As I'm reflecting on it, I'm just thinking of how many ways my educational experience there, but also my extracurricular experience there really 
shaped my life. And, um, you know, I arrived just even with the whole aspect of naming and identity. I, when I arrived in Tehran, I was 11 years old and I, my parents had been divorced. I hadn't seen my dad in two years and my mother had passed away. So I was coming to Iran from of all places, a very mixed race community in the US Virgin Islands. But moving from an island in the Caribbean to a big Middle Eastern city was a bit of a shock. And going from being an only child to suddenly living in a large collective family household where I was no longer an only child who could do whatever I want. Although my cousins would tell you that I continued to behave as if I was an only child. Um, it was all really difficult and there were a lot of challenges and going from being Linda Day to Linda Barchande while I was at community school was a bit of an identity shift. But when I did leave community school, I had changed and I had become an Iranian American and I had become part of a global community. And my friend, my, some of my deepest friendships today are still friends from those years at community school. Um, and, and so it really was, I can echo, it was a safe haven. It was an, a window on the world you know, I think back on Mr. Rosashi's geography classes and that was eighth grade. And I think anyone in my, my year, he was probably the most esteemed teacher. He also taught journalism and did the yearbook. And, you know, it was so interesting to be part of a journalistic process in the school where our school paper had to go before government censors before we could publish it. And the school yearbook had to go before government censors. And sometimes the advertising that we sold would get censored because of one thing or another. It gives you such a different perspective on the world when you've lived with censorship, when you've learned about just all the different cultural experiences that people have. And we all came together and had a great time. I mean, in my era at community school, our biggest rival was the Tehran American School. And that tended to color some of my perceptions of Americans. So when I left Iran and moved to Iowa, that was a, again, a whole new awakening about what it does mean to be American. And during my years, the Americans that I encountered in Iran were not the, the friendliest towards anyone that wasn't 100% American. It was just a different time. And that was in the, in the 70s. The other thing nobody has touched on is that I, in the 1975-76 year, which was my 10th grade year, we had this amazing extracurricular program that happened once a week, Wednesday afternoons, which was the equivalent of our Friday, where we could go hiking or take a cooking class or visit parts of the city that we wouldn't necessarily have visited. And apparently a lot of the more academically oriented parents put the kibosh on that because they thought we should just be doing academics. But um, I moved to Colorado for college because I wanted to hike like I had done in Iran. I wanted to ski like I had learned to ski in Iran. Um, and I went to a school where I could study things in depth, in very in-depth way like we had done in Iran. So I, I kind of feel like my whole life has been an extension of those years. So I guess that's, that's probably, I'll just leave it at that. Um, but community school has deeply shaped my life and I always feel a connection when I meet someone from there. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll hear from our final speaker today, Tara Barampur. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I, I'm kind of lucky that I get to go last because I learned so much from just listening to all of you. Uh, I would have been the class of 85. So I started community school in fourth grade, uh, 1976. And then I was there until basically the school was closed for much of, well, end of 1978 and then into 79 when we left. It, it reopened briefly thereafter, but we had left. So, um, my well first of all when i was there it was there was no lord's prayer um no portraits of jesus um no sir and ma'am with the teachers it was very casual um i i just learned now that it had a chapel um uh, it was there was a lot of american pop music but there was a lot of culture it, it didn't 
even though it was it was a sort of it was American and, and many of the teachers or most of the teachers that I had were American, not all of them were. And it it didn't feel like American culture was the dominant culture in the way that I think Shireen is saying about the American kids at TAS who were, you know, seemed fully American. Community school had American kids, but they were one of many other cultures. And so it felt like all of the cultures blended together enough where there were there were enough of them to sort of balance out the others. So, you know, we read books that were not American. We read Tintin books and we read Enid Blyton books. And then we also got the Beezus and Ramona from the library. You know, we had the football team and we had the soccer teams. You know, so it was it was a very nice balance. Um, I'm, you know, listening to you all uh, for for my class and, and the people that I know who are around my age or a little bit older, a little bit younger, it's very poignant and bittersweet to listen to all of this because we are very jealous of you. We, you know, our, our education and our community and our experience there was cut off very abruptly. You know, many of us you know, went home from school one day and, you know, over the weeks in 1978, school would shut down and then we'd go back to school and then it would shut down again and then we'd go back. And every time we went back, there was someone missing. There was a teacher missing. There were, you know, more empty desks. And it, it just, you know, it, it, was, it was a loss that, um, that my classmates that who I, I subsequently hooked up with many, many years later, uh, I saw this in their faces and in what they said about it, that there was always this wistfulness that we didn't get to, you know, grow up and, and out of community school. It was always this, this truncated thing. Um, so, you know, so it's nice to hear what would have been, and it's also, you know, it's a little bit hard. Um, I'm gonna read something that I wrote in, 20, in 2006. Um, and this is when there was a, a, a community school reunion that I didn't attend, but they had asked me to write something because I had attended one in 2000 as a reporter at the New York Times. And at the time, you know, I'd been assigned to go cover this reunion in New York City, and I didn't think I would know anyone. And then, of course, I ran into all these classmates and people actually remembered each other. And, you know, it was it was very moving. So when I was at that reunion in 2000, I had gone with a photographer from the Times and and she was this very sort of experienced, hard bitten, like nothing can shake her. And by the end of the night, she came up to me, her name was Frances, and she came up to me and she said, do you think there could ever be another school like this in the world? And so I, what I wrote um, is sort of, you know, my attempt to answer that question or, or, or talk about why she asked it. Um, so I'm just gonna read from this. To me, the community school was more than just a school. It was the first community I embraced outside my family. I had transferred there from a school I didn't particularly like, one run on antiquated British traditions like overfeeding kids and forcing them to play outdoors in bad weather. I loved community school from the start. I loved its dusty old brick buildings with their blue window frames. I loved the giant trees that shaded the pathways. I loved the relaxed attitudes of the teachers. They trusted the students. The students could sense it. And for the most part, they rose to meet that trust. I loved that in fifth grade, I could stay after school for gymnastics and be coached by high schoolers. I even loved the long commute, the Bee Gees songs and Broadway musicals we sang on bus number 57 the soccer we played in the aisle with a wadded up paper ball. At the end of the day, our buses would roll out the gate into that ramshackle South Tehran neighborhood and we hardly registered the contrast it made with our shiny promising lives. Years later, I was shocked to read that one of the biggest massacres of the revolution, which took place a few blocks away from our school, occurred in September, 1978, when we were still riding in and out on those buses and the community school still felt immune from history, which it had been. As the world writhed through the 20th century, community school was a haven. In the 1940s, it enrolled refugees from Nazi-occupied Europe. In the 1960s, refugees came from Iraq. 
In the 1970s, my friends were Iranian, American, Indian, Argentine, Taiwanese, Vietnamese. There were no minorities. No homeland was too strange or distant. We took for granted that this was how the world worked. People of diverse cultures and religious mixing and religions mixing arbitrarily with no question of dividing among those lines, along those lines. It was truly a community and my friends and I were thrilled to be a part of it. Couldn't wait to move across campus to the junior high area and into the high school building when like the kids we'd seen in the yearbooks, we too would act in plays and take field trips to Persepolis and join sports teams. In the fall of 1978, we entered junior high. We proudly bought our books from the school store and signed up for class electives. The occasional gunshots on the other side of the wall were punctuations, like thunderclaps producing no rain. We registered them, then forgot them. Feeling terribly mature, we sat under the trees during free periods and talked to boys as if they were normal people. That activity was interrupted when school started closing because of shuluhi in the streets. It would reopen after a few days and we'd rush back with relief and try to remember where we'd broken off. But each time school closed, it stayed closed longer. Each time we returned, more desks were empty, more friends gone. In January, after weeks with no school and not much gas or electricity, my family left too. On a trip back to Tehran in the 1990s, a friend and I went in search of the community school. My friend had graduated a few months before the revolution, I think 78, and, but even she had a hard time remembering where it was. Fortunately, some men at, the, at a juice bar on Jale Square remembered the old foreign school and directed us to the right Kuche. The school looked smaller, of course, but it looked the same. It was still a school, a boys high school now, since we weren't mothers of the students there, the gatekeeper wouldn't let us in. So we knocked on the door of an apartment building across the street, walked up several flights and gazed over it from above. The students had left for the day and a little rain sprinkled over the empty courtyard. The sense that one's world can be lost is profoundly disturbing, especially to a child just beginning to look out past her own garden walls. After the revolution in Iran, feeling the loss of that world wasn't just about being Iranian. I know non-Iranians who felt it after returning to their home countries from community school. And as Francis's question showed me, feeling the loss of community school wasn't really even about ever having enrolled there. It seems to me that our school was the most natural kind of community for humans to create, and certainly the kind of place I imagine a parent would most want to send a child. The Tehran Community School doesn't exist anymore, and I had to answer Francis by saying that I, don't, I didn't know if another like it existed anywhere in the world, but I very much hope that it does. That's all. Wow. Um, rather than, you know, just kind of ask a random question, I'd just ask you all if you have questions for each other or you know, kind of points that you think would make for good discussion, given what we've kind of heard so far today. Well, I really want the biblical education. I want to read that book. So thank you for the, you know, for the title. I mean, it'd be great to, you know, as you said that, I was thinking, wow, I wonder if someone has the curriculum. Oh, Listen, we, our class, we have our notes. We have notes from Mitty's history class and we have notes and we have Bibles that say smoke trash, not hash inside or whatever, smoke hash, not trash or whatever. So I think a lot of us have artifacts and from the 70s. And I, I've now understanding that it wasn't so much the 70s, but it was also a change of regimes, mm -hmm. sort of that slowly it became secularized. But the Bible is history. I went back to it during my time in academia <laughs> and see where did I get my ideas from? And it's pretty extraordinary. So I hope you will. I'd love to. I will. I'll send you a copy. <laughs> you got to sign your book, though for me. <laughs> Happily. Just on this point really quickly, I'm seeing people mentioning scrapbooks and other things in the chat. You know, what would a, a community school 
former community school students kind of archive look like? You say kind of the artifacts of the community school experience and one of them, I guess, would be, you know, kind of books that were used and you know, what would be kind of other items, either, you know, textual or kind of material culture that would be part of that, you know, kind of hypothetical student archive? Oh, from, from my era, it would definitely be the blank map of the world. It was the bane of every student's existence every Saturday, which was the equivalent of Monday we had to go to our geography class and put on, I think it was 10 new cities every, every week that we had to know the location of on the blank map, mountain ranges, rivers. I mean, I'm always, I cannot play Trivial Pursuit, but if I'm ever forced to play on one of those trivial games, I only know geography. I don't know any, anything else, <laughs> but it, um, I think that's the, everyone always refers to Mr. Ozashi and his blank maps, and that would have to be one of the the items in the. Anyone else want to weigh in on this question, or perhaps there, address another one? Yeah. Like, well, was there a list of textbooks anywhere, or you know, did any administrators sort of keep track of that? That's a really good question. I don't know about the post, you know, kind of mid sixties period, but I, I, did, I wasn't, you know, when I went through kind of the, you know, letters of the folks from, you know, the mid thirties through the mid sixties, I wasn't, I wasn't taking note of that. I don't know. I bet you they are mentioned um, or if, you know, there was like a school uh, curriculum or, you know, you know, kind of different book assignments in, in the PHS archives or if it would exist somewhere else. It, it must. If, if I might say something, um, I don't recall any lists, but I do recall vividly that a number of the texts that we use, particularly in history, were college level texts. Hmm. Well, and uh, I would echo that, that in my 10th grade year, our there was some problem in the Persian Gulf at the port and our textbooks for American history were um, stuck there and so we had to proceed with our American history class without textbooks and the, the teacher taught us from her college history notes and it was one of the best history classes I've ever had in my life having then gone on to liberal arts college and all of that um, the, the teaching was phenomenal but we did do they just expected us to rise to the occasion and be at be able to think conceptually and you know, it was a, it was a pretty in, it was, te they were teaching us critical thinking and expected us to be at, at a higher level than kids in standard, you know, in, in other schools from my understanding. I would, I would echo that expectation of being able to cope with, with higher level text. The, the text that was used by Mr. Irvine in that 10th grade class I talked about uh, was actually used by my wife as a freshman level text uh, at Oberlin when some years later. Uh, and the, the, the history text that was uh, approached in the 12th grade US history course was a two volume uh, work by Morrison and Commager, The Growth of the American Republic, which when I mentioned it to, uh, to a, a department chair when I was in my first teaching class said, oh, that's too difficult for our sophomore level class here. When I got to the States in sixth grade, it, it took about two years before I had to pay attention in class again. <laughs> in fact, in seventh grade, they took me out of class to teach English to refugees from Vietnam. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh my God. Well, I'd like to testify too that I entered my freshman year in college in uh, uh, 73 with a huge, uh, several, course credits for my achievement scores and um also with students who'd never written a 40 page paper before and i said you know i was like what you haven't written these papers so it was definitely rigorous as well as fun <laughs> you know you asked about artifacts and I'm sure you didn't have this in mind, but this is the only thing I have, which is my sixth grade notebook. Oh, oh. 
Oh, the stickers. And as you were talking, I realized, because I hadn't looked at this for a long time, but there's actually a, a list of the books that we had to buy for sixth grade. Oh, wow. So I could, um, you know, I don't know if there's, if anyone's collecting these things um, it, and their prices, 800 reals, 250 reals. So, um, you know, if, the, if anyone's collecting textbook, names of textbooks, I could, I could send that along. That would be very helpful. That's it's amazing that items like that are you know still with us, right? I mean, I really I remember distinctly like buying the books at the store and felt so grown up to be mm -hmm. buying textbooks. And you know, just looking through the notebook and I've got you know my corrections from Mr. Pulford and Miss Flaherty and um, teachers that we loved, even though we only had them for a few months. My friends and I and the ensuing years talked about these teachers with so much you know depth of passion they, they made a big impression i'm curious um because we have you know such a you know quite an ex you know 25 years or so period of kind of community schools history in one place right here it's not something that happens every day i'm wondering if there were um different um um things that maybe kind of the earlier classes were surprised to hear from the later classes and things that the later classes maybe were surprised to learn about or you know hear about from the other classes i think the piece about religious emphasis is important and it's come up in a few of the kind of comments and questions, but um, we could think about anything in addition to the religious emphasis. Um. Well, I, I frankly was surprised to learn how much the school moved away from the religious emphasis in the 70s. Uh, and I presume it started in the 60s as well. Although, um, you know, when I was a student, we had required Bible classes twice a week. The chapel was 30 minutes every morning before classes and after homeroom. Um, but one of the things that I recall is that, um, yes, I, I would echo, there's no effort to convert anyone um, in one particular a series of Bible classes, I recall, there was a lively discussion between the teacher, I think it was Mr. Bryan, and many of the students as to the existence of God. He was presenting the classic proofs of the existence of God, and uh, I wouldn't have any of it, uh, but, you know, I was trying to argue on the other side. And it was an intellectually very interesting process. And uh, I think one of the things I had very strong sense of is that the school had a majority of students who were not Christian. Uh, the largest cohort were Iraqi Jews like Harry Shamoon and his cousin David. Um, and the school respected all religions, I think, equally, even though they themselves, the missionary teachers were uh, convinced enough of their own religion that they were willing to, uh, if short-termers dedicate three years of their lives to this process, or if they were career missionaries, their entire teaching careers. And uh, I found it an extraordinary thing to look back on. Um, even, you know, and I, I in fact, was uh, from a family that was Jewish and non-observant, uh, um, and I found it rather difficult, especially at first, to cope with these required classes with the looming pictures of Jesus in every classroom. Mm -hmm. And in retrospect, you know, I have the sense that when we sang Faith of Our Fathers Living Still, it wasn't necessarily just aimed at Christians and the Christian faith. It was a reinforcement of family values and family faiths. Uh, or maybe I'm making that up, but that's the sense of the school that I have to this day. Oh man. <laughs> it's just too relevant. 
right now. You know, <laughs> it's too painfully relevant because on one hand you want to say, I don't know a single person who went to community school who left their family's heritage to join the Christian community. On the other hand, you know, and, and so I want to say, you do not convert by the sword of indoctrination, you know? And I also, because I had always thought of Calvinism as, as an extremely conservative form of Christianity. And that's not what I experienced. And in the course of moving, it, of being in America, when the first thing some of my American friends showed me were, were Tammy Faye and stuff, it, that Christianity was so foreign <laughs> from, from my comprehension and to this day. And then when it comes down to curriculum, uh, I'm having a terrible time in Virginia. <laughs> about you know either way because it, what we learned is that it's organic you know this it's it's the natural way for humans to be that's i i learned that and it's unequivocal to me and all of this legislation to do one thing or the other and i will say i was very embarrassed in chapel that my girlfriends were singing these hymns and I was like, you know, just kind of, uh, and I, I love that thing of the music and the harmony because to me, Alohe Akbar means Alleluia. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all, and, and that started for me in childhood, but certainly, at community school. And as an educator, I'm very concerned about uh, curriculum. Thanks. Awesome. Just to, to kind of piggyback on that a little bit too, is when I was there, it was really, we had made the shift to the secular, but this notion of tolerance and of understanding both, understanding different perspectives was woven into our experience. and. When I was in eighth grade, again, Mr. Razashi's class, I don't remember which Israeli-Arab war broke out, but we had the Saudi Arabian ambassador's daughter in our class. And we had some very intense Israeli kids in our class. And Mr. And they would scream at each other in the hallways. And Mr. Razashi put a stop to it. And he said, we're going to talk about both sides of this conflict. Beautiful. You know, so... So I learned very much that year. And then later that year, we did something. We were studying something about South Africa. And he put me, knowing I had been lived in the Caribbean for four years in a multiracial society, he put me on the side of the debate having to defend apartheid, which to this day still makes me ill that he did it. But it was, again, I mean, however many years, 50 years later, I still think about it, you know, of that that yes. there are always, there's always more than one side to an issue. And I really learned that um, in, in community school. And Tara, what you described in the piece that you wrote about, it wasn't one nationality over any other. We were a mixed group and, you know, everybody brought something different to the table, but it was all, there was nobody marginalized because of nationality. Maybe other things we might've picked on somebody, but um, it was not about nationality or religion or creed or color or whatever. Somehow they managed to enforce that or, or you know, I mean, I, enforce is the wrong word, but sort of like instill it mm -hmm. in a way that we didn't even feel it. But interestingly, I, I did attend uh, Iran Zamin and it, it, there was not a whiff of of co you know christian coercion then and that's why i've always thought ah, it was the 70s and things had really relaxed and the whole world seemed to be moving toward uh uh peace love and understanding you know and and there there was also during uh i i also want to say that in the early 70s we had students whose last name was Pahlavi who were anti-Shah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
And so that's another thing that I, I don't, I don't know. How much did we keep our mouth shut because we knew Savak was there? I don't know. Well, this point that uh, Tara raised, I think is very interesting. And of course it relates to what, you know, a couple of you have just been saying. Um, because when I think of what was happening at community school, I often put on my like liberal arts core curriculum, global citizenship, interdisciplinary requirement, Ooh. director hat, <laughs> right? <laughs> Um, and it's often very, you know, sometimes at least it's difficult when you get, you know, certain majors or just students who aren't interested in, you know, kind of core curriculum classes and they have to learn about the world for a semester or, you know, occasionally it can feel a little coerced with all the different pressures kind of on higher education nowadays. So Tara, you said it just seemed so natural and it didn't feel like it was being, you know, kind of pushed on anybody, but that it was something that was um, kind of natural and everyone was picking up on. Could, could you speak just a little bit more to that point or maybe others would like to as well, but. It was, yeah. it was assumed that you were from somewhere, mm -hmm. just like it's assumed that you have a birthday, you know? So it, <laughs> it, you know, there was no one who, who wasn't from somewhere. So, you know, everyone would just kind of present themselves and then they would go back to their country and bring something cool back. Like, the Indian friend would bring mango back from India, which we'd never tried. And the Israeli friend brought strawberries, which at the time we didn't have, or, you know, so, so, or like the girl went to England and brought a halter top bikini, which you couldn't buy in, in Iran, at least hmm. for kids, maybe for grownups. But anyway, I mean, like everyone, it, and, and this is, you know, probably also part of just living in an international kind of cosmopolitanish city where you know it's it's just assumed that you're bringing something that, that what you're not going to be at community school if you're not bringing something from somewhere even if you're Iranian like there's a reason well why you know you, you speak good enough English to get in or why did your parents want to send you there so everybody was I guess different enough from whatever their mainstream culture might have been where they came from that it, there was no assumption that you had to fit into something or, or, or throw away something that you were. It was assumed that you had to announce it and contribute it in order to create this sort of multi-flavored pie that we were all making. So I have a, qu I have a question for the panelists, uh, and it might be just my perspective, but we as students certainly experienced what we've been talking about, but did that translate to our parents' families? Because I think that at least impressionistically for the Iraqi Jewish community, my parents had a very closed circle of acquaintances and friends. Um, and this internationalism and broad perspective was something that my brother and I experienced at community school, but I'm not sure went beyond. Oh no, it took some years. It took marriages. It took marriages that were excoriated. And slowly, I'm very happy to say in my experience, it mostly happened in the USA, which poof, you know, but I think uh, that's so good and that's so important. And I really want to share uh, a memory that Matt very deftly coaxed out of me in the interview because it unites my experience as an American with uh, my long, uh, my childhood and adolescence in Iran. And that is the sense memory of, of my first day of high school and absolutely panicked and going through Jale and the chaos and then the, the, the bus going magically into this beautiful, exactly as you've all ex described it, you know, cathedral-like trees, everything protective, children playing and how beautiful it was. And it soothed me immediately. And I realized it's because my only good memory of education until then was on the Upper West Side of PS 75, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan, PS 75, 93rd Street, 
in an extraordinarily multicultural, uh, low income neighborhood. And this, that I re and I loved kindergarten so much. Julio, Black Cuban, you know, Kathleen, the Asian lady who did our laundry you know, uh, daughter. And so I'm very happy to say that it, it's possible in this country too, in the public school system, because if it existed in 1962 or whatever, before they bulldozed that uh, neighborhood <laughs> or gentrified it, uh, that they, we had show and tell, like what Tara said, with Aura bringing her menorah, you know, <laughs> and it was so much, it just was a whole different feeling in the zeitgeist. And I think that ye for years, the torture of my education, including these hideous facilities that were, you know, lo looked like post Stalin going into that school with all these kids and all these languages too, because I, there, the kids spoke Spanish. Some of the parents couldn't speak Spanish, you know? <laughs> and I feel as if that first day, I really had a sense of coming home. And this gives me great uh, hope. <laughs> Christine, just really quickly, and without getting into too much detail, I think it's interesting that when your father was working for the aid mission and you were at TAS, and then when the aid mission closes in 1967 and he's you know, kind of doing his own work and you're at community school, it seems like that kind of move from kind of the American colony to this broader, you know, international situation, you know, maybe was something that you and your you know, oh. father maybe shared. And I kind of wonder. Well, very, with my father, interesting... I, I went to TAS as the daughter of the most of one of the most high ranking diplomats in the United States State Department and his he was the regional legal um, advisor, regional meaning jetting from Tel Aviv to Damascus. You know, the 60s, the world was different too. And so he was going all over um, the place. And his other main mission was to close down the aid mission, which, which was a hugely significant uh, event in Iran-US relations. Now, my dad, like Howard Baskerville, you know, he threw his entire fate and that of his family in with the destiny of Iran. And he, he had come to love Iran so much and he uh, flung us out, all out beyond the protection of the American um, legation there, you know, to, and that was very much a part of it too, of, of having that haven. And I see too that the, the TAS, my first football game at the American embassy, some TAS kids who I'd gone to school with harassed me, yeah. you know, yeah. how can you go to school with those ragheads and all? So, but I, I, I've overcome my prejudice against, uh, you know, um, strident Christianity as well as strident American patriotism, because hopefully I've learned wisdom in my old age. Kind of Sharif, tying yeah. this all together, I did just text my friend who I was pretty sure knew the, the morning prayer that Mr. Hill oh. would read. Oh, and, good. and I have his recollection of it. And it, I think it summarizes some of what it is we've been discussing. Um, he says it goes like this. As we begin this new day, we ask that God's presence and guidance be with the peoples and rulers of all lands. And we especially ask this for Iran and its leaders, His Imperial Majesty, the Shah and Shah, Her Imperial Majesty, the Shah Banu, and for the Crown Prince. 
Dun, 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 yeah, and then right. Yes. Oh my God. But you know, it, it fits with the spirit of the school being for everyone, and then most especially for the the ruler of the ruler. Our gracious of the host. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that was inbred. Probably, I mean, it was just part of the culture of the school, beginning with the missionaries. I think having respect for the culture. I, I want to say one other thing that maybe is an intermediary, an intermediate fact. I think this may well have been a deliberately constructed environment because I'm aware that in the 50s, um, there was considerable concern by Mr. Irvine and others that there were too many Americans in the school. And it was, I think, Irvine's initiative to go to the American embassy and suggest that an American school be established for the dependence of official Americans. And that's the origin of uh, TAS. And when I got to Iran in 1956, as an upcoming freshman in high school, TA, what was then called uh, the American Dependence School, only went through the eighth grade. And I was aware that there were really perhaps almost half the, pub, the student body in the, in the high school were Americans, we were cliquish. Uh, I wasn't aware of, of conflicts between the Americans and the non-Americans, but I suspect from uh, my recollections, but also from having looked at some of the records in the, in the Presbyterian Historical Society, where I have not been in over 20 years, uh, so there's probably a lot more of this material, that there was continuing pressure on the embassy to make TAS a full K through 12 school in order to have community school be something that you described that Tara described as a place where everyone had a home land just as they had a birthday, but you didn't have this overwhelming uh, crew of Americans uh, who shaped the school body in ways that are very different from what you described in the, in the elementary school and what Tara described uh, in the 70s. Yes. Fascinating. So, so again, I, th I think this was, as I, as I try to understand it, it was something that was deliberately fostered. And it fits in with my sense of, of, of trying to make the, the international baccalaureate, um, which would be a truly international program that would enable people to go to university anywhere. Oh boy. I taught that. I taught International Beckett Laureate Theater all over. I'd be the scourge of the teacher. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I love it. I, and I'll say that personally, my passion for international and interdisciplinary education is, has uh, been quite evident in my career choices. So, oh. Okay, I'm going to jump in. We, we're reaching the end of our time. So I just want to thank you all so much for this great conversation. And I want to acknowledge that a lot of conversation has been happening in the chat. There are a lot of alumni here who are getting in touch with each other. There have been a lot of questions asked of the panelists. And I know that we haven't been able to address all of those. So I just want to let you all know that we will be saving the chat and sharing it with Matthew and the panelists. So um, we will get in touch um, if you've requested to be in touch with anyone. Um, and thank you to David Woodward who shared a link to the Facebook group for the alumni network. So if you're not on there, definitely check that out and continue to have this conversation there. Um, so again, thank you so much to, to Matthew for moderating and thank you to our panelists for being here this evening and sharing your experiences with us. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing more of them um, as Matthew's oral history project progresses. Matthew just um, shared his email address in the chat as well. So if you're interested in being involved in Matthew's project,
please email him um, and reach out. Um, and Matthew, if you want to say any words in closing, I'll let you do that now. I don't think I have anything to say beyond just thank you so much to those who attended and, and to the, you know, all of you, the, the discussants on the round table, your, your comments were just, I was moved to tears uh, in a few cases. So um, just extraordinary to hear um, the memories about community school, you know, from across, you know, such a, uh, such a period of time um, here over Zoom. So um, I'm looking forward to, you know, kind of following up with, with you all and to the future conversations. Just thank you. Thank you, Matthew. You. Thank you, Matthew. Yes, thank, thank you. you all. Yes, thank you so much. Everybody, we have each other's uh, emails, right? And Tara, I need, I'm going to send you a copy of the Bible is History. So everybody, this has just meant so much to me. You all. I, we're very lucky to have attended community school. Yes. Thank you yes. for bringing us together. Yes. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.